morning guys so I'm going to do video two of past the shallows today we will cover pages 23 to 43 okay hope you're having a great day bye I can buy lunch Harry pulled out the crumpled notes and coins he'd stuffed into his pocket and put them on the table oh Harry auntie Jean's eyes closed for a second you're so much like your mother she went to touch his head, but her hand only got part of the way before she pulled it back. Harry stared at the last toasted sandwich triangle on the table. It was cheese and ham. Go on, you have it, she said. Harry grabbed it and started eating. He tried not to look at Auntie Jean because he knew she was crying. She wiped her face with a hanky and took a big breath. Tea always makes things better, doesn't it? She poured some into her cup and added milk. Harry nodded. We'll do a big shop at the supermarket before we leave town, but I want to get back before dark so we'll be quick. Can we get peanut butter? Harry asked. Arnie Jean closed her eyes again and Harry pushed his chair away from the table and stood up. I'm just going to the toilet, he said. He took his time washing his hands twice before drying them carefully with the paper towel. When he opened the door that led to, into the cafe, he saw that Auntie Jean was back to normal. She smiled at him when he sat down. The trip home went by quickly and the sun was on its way down, but there was still enough light for Harry to inspect his show bags, piece by piece. He wondered what Miles would choose to eat first. Whatever it was, he'd choose the same. Thanks, Harry said. Thanks, Harry said, and he meant it. Auntie Jean nodded and smiled. She unloaded the shopping out of but left the bags by the front door. Get your brother to give you a hand. I won't stop in. This wasn't unusual. If dad was home, Auntie Jean and dad didn't speak anymore. Not since she made dad buy Uncle Nick's share of the boat and he had to get another loan. Here, she put his smaller show bags inside the cabri bag so it looked like he only had two. Best not to show off. Give Miles the rest of the money to look after. Harry was desperate to get inside in case she started crying again, but he waited until she got back in the car. He waved, then opened the front door. Dad was on the couch watching TV. We got some shopping, Dad. It's all here. Dad barely looked over but nodded. Miles and I will unpack it. Harry ran through the lounge, carrying the show bags. Miles was lying on his bed, staring at the ceiling. Miles, I got you a show bag. Shh, Dad's got a headache. Harry shut the door. He tried to talk quietly. I found 20 bucks. I got you a Cadbury's bag. A Cadbury's bag. Harry held the purple bag up higher so that Miles could see it properly. I got Stuart a Redskins bag and I got a Cadbury bag too. And a Redskins and a Birdie Beetle. You can share if you want. There's a dark gun game. We can play it later. Harry noticed that Miles was holding his hands strangely. They were red and swollen and they looked bad. Did you hurt your hands on the boat? Miles sat up slowly. I just gotta wait for the blisters to heal up, that's all. You could put fish cream on them, maybe later. Miles went to lie back down, but Harry stopped him. We've got to unpack the shopping, it's at the door. I'll carry the bags, you can put the stuff away. We got six bags, we got everything. Cup of soups, macaroni, milo, peanut butter. Harry dumped the show bags on the bed and headed back to the door, hoping Miles would follow. They unpacked quickly with out talking, Harry grinned when he handed Miles a family-sized packet of teddy bear biscuits. Another beer, Dad? Miles asked. He nodded and Miles took over a can from the fridge. Harry walked back to the bedroom and started arranging his chocolate lollies on the floor. What are you going to have first, he asked when Miles came in. Miles just shrugged. I think I'm going to eat the plain Freddo and one red skin. Then I'll choose two things tomorrow. Maybe you should just eat what you want now. Miles sat on his bed and looked at the pile. What are you saving it all for anyway? Harry put all the sweets back in their bags except for the Freddo. If I save them, they'll last longer. They'll last until school, he said. He looked up at Miles. Aren't you going to have any of yours? I'm just tired. Miles lay back down on the bed again. You're lucky you get seasick, Harry. You would, won't ever have to work on the boat. Harry sat on the floor and took small, quiet bites of his chocolate frog. Miles kept his eyes on the water and listened to the engine. He listened to the chug chug and the air pumps whirling churn. As long as it kept pumping, as long as he sorted in time, as long as he steered the boat carefully, everything would be okay. But out at the friars, steep and black seals watched the boat from the rocks where they lay on piles half asleep. 
The cliffs behind them were like giant guardians standing tall. And God, it felt like some kind of ancient place. The water sucked and moved, smashing against the rocks, and no matter how Miles positioned the boat, no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't keep a clear fix on the airlines. He wiped the sea spray off his face, checked the air pump one more time, and he thought about going into the cabin for a minute to thaw out, to get out of the wind, but he saw something in the water, a catch bag. It broke the surface, inflatable boys pulling it up from the deep, and Miles edged the boat closer. He hooked the bag with one with a long metal rod and dragged it around to the back where the boat was flat and low. With his hands on the netting, he leaned back and used his body weight to get the abalone up on deck. Yesterday he had fallen backwards when the bags lurched out of the water, but not this time. This bag was light, not even half full. Inside the abs stuck fast to each other and formed one giant rock. Mile used a blunt metal blade to separate them. He sorted them by size and put them in plastic tubs. Most of them were small, undersized, but Miles knew better than to throw them back. Dad would kill him. The cannery turned a blind eye to these things. They never asked questions, not of Dad anyway. When the bag was empty, Miles checked over the abs. Most of them had stuck to each other again. Piled high in the corners of the blue plastic tubs, he reached into the water and picked one up and held it upside down. The black slimy disc of flesh flinched against the cold air and it was strong, that muscle. If you put it against your skin, it would grab on and suck hard. It was the only defense it had. He used to feel sorry for the abs when he was young, the way they pulsed and moved in the tubs, sensing the bright light and heat, but he couldn't think about them like that now. He was only careful not to cut or bruise them because once abs started to bleed, they kept on bleeding until all the liquid inside them was gone. They just dried up and died. Miles looked up as Martin's bald head appeared in the water. He dropped the abalone back in its tub, watched Martin pulling himself up on deck and sit on the back of the boat. He was such a big man, such a thick wide back and a thick wide neck, and he never wore a hood, so his skin was always red from the cold, but he wasn't like, like he looked. He wasn't like Dad. He took his mask and mouthpiece off, and but he didn't speak. He was just breathing, taking big breaths in and out with his head down. Miles stood behind him for a moment and waited. He went to get the bag Martin had brought up with him out of the water, but Martin stood up and stopped him. I'm the one being paid, he said, and he winked. Miles stood back, watching Martin work. He watched his hands so quick and careful, and even when his bloodshot sh eyes looked out at the water, his... Hands never stopped moving. The tool never slipped. His hands never hesitated. They just separated and sorted smoothly until the bag was empty. Then he put the shucking knife down, walked into the cabin and poured some tea out of the thermos. He handed Miles a cup. They'll be up soon, he said. Miles took his gloves off and held the warm cup against his bare hands. The sun was high now and the water had changed from black to deep blue and the white water churning up against the rocks was so bright against the sky that it was almost blinding. It must be at least 10, maybe even 11 already. There was a seal resting in the swell, its head and neck reaching out of the water and Miles could see its black eyes, its long whiskers. It looked right at the boat right at Miles and sniffed the air like it knew exactly what had been taken. What was on board? It opened its mouth and let out a hoarse protest before it disappeared back under the surface. Jeff lurched on board. His face was pink, squeezed tight by the, his protective hood and he peeled his head free, sat on the back of the boat. Glad to see you're working hard, Miles, he said. Miles looked at the tin cup in his hands. He had only taken a few sips, but he chucked the rest over the side and returned the cup to the cabin. He walked over to Jeff, picking up his flippers, gloves and hood and put them in the fresh water bucket. And he could hear Jeff's breathing over the sound of the waves and the sound of the engine, Jeff's heavy breath. And he stayed where he was for a long time. He didn't even try to get up. He just sat there, skin on his face, still pink. Martin paced around the boat. He held the slack airline in his hands and looked out at the water. Miles watched his eyes the way they skimmed back and forth over the surface. Dad had been down for a long time. Miles looked over the side. Below in the murky darkness, the swirling kelp, all you had to guide you was one hand touching the rock wall while your legs kicked you down blind. 
and that's where they were the abalone down where the algae grew thick where the continental shelf dropped away they could eat their way across kilometers of submerged rock those creatures and there were caves and crevices places to get stuck places where the air hose could get snagged miles had only been down once but that was enough he had been scared of the darkness and of the kelp wrapping around his legs he'd been scared of the heavy feeling in his chest and it made his head buzz like crazy the pressure the weight of it all all that water in a few years he could have he would have to dive down there for real dad surfaced close to the rocks and martin had him he pulled him in and dad was still in the water when he ripped his mouthpiece away and let out a roar jesus he said jesus he was still saying jesus when he clambered on the deck he'd brought up two full bags and the abs were huge a few days of this a few days of this and we're back he looked at miles and he smiled harry put his parker on and picked up the red skin show bag he got for stuart he wasn't meant to walk around by himself not if he wasn't going to arty jeans but he thought going to stuart's would be okay anyway dad wouldn't know he walked through to the lounge and slipped his feet into rubber gum boots. They were freezing. He thought about grabbing another pair of socks, but he couldn't be bothered. His feet would warm up if he walked fast. He'd walk fast. Outside the light was flat and even, and the same grey light that the, there always was. Sometimes, right in the middle of the day, the sun shone bright and broke through, but it never made anything warm. Not the air or the ground. Not really. At the end of the drive, Harry turned onto the gravel road. He listened for cars, listened for trucks. He checked for dust clouds up ahead. It was clear. After his house, there weren't any houses for a while, not near the river anyway. The place was thick with trees, black with them, and there wasn't anything else but trees until you crossed the bridge and went around the corner. After that, there, where the road was straight, there was scrub and rectangles of cleared land full of weeds. A few old fire tracks, a few old farmhouses, not much. But that's where Stuart lived. He lived in a caravan. It was a caravan with a wooden shed attached to it. So it was like a house really. And Harry didn't think that it could even move anymore. The caravan because it had been in one place for so long. It had been there for all of Stuart's life, maybe even longer. And it had sunk down into the earth so that its wheels were almost buried. Stuart. Mum's white Ford Cortina wasn't in the drive, but Harry walked up to the door and knocked anyway. No one answered. Maybe they had gone to set up the stall. Stuart's mum grew berries, raspberries and blackberries, and she sold them on the road just outside of Huonville. She usually just left an honesty box, but sometimes on the weekends or holidays when there were people from Hobart driving down, she would stay at the store. Stuart hated it when he had to stay there, but at least he got to go to Huonville and look at all the shops. It was better than hanging around here. Harry put the show bag by the door. He rolled it up in case it rained and then he walked away, but he didn't walk fast now. He took his time. Stuart and his mum might drive past they might come back a truck appeared when he was nearly back at the bridge and harry stood in the ditch and cl closed his eyes tight against the grit that kicked up in his face against the wind and he could smell the sap even over all the dust he could smell the freshly cut trees the smell of crushed leaves when he opened his eyes the truck was lost in a haze of smoke and gravel and dust there wouldn't be another truck for a while he walked into the onto the bridge and leant against the railings on one side. The dark water of Loon River was moving with a silent speed that made the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. He picked up a rock and dropped it over the edge. It disappeared instantly into the rushing water and didn't leave, even leave a mark on the surface. You would need a million rocks to make a dent. He looked for bigger rocks on the side of the road to chuck into the river and he nearly stepped on a dead bandicoot. It was in perfect nick, its stripy fur and speckled white cheeks still intact, Harry bent down to inspect it closely. Only a dried trickle of blood coming from the corner of its mouth gave away that it was dead and not just asleep. And it must be pretty fresh because it hadn't been eaten by quolls or devils or been picked up by a wedge tail yet. Joe collected roadkill, only the good ones though. He stripped it away, all the fur and flesh, and rebuilt the skeletons like 
the megafauna at Hobart Museum only smaller. The biggest one he had was a wallaby, but Harry liked the Tassie Devil best, with its big jaw and sharp teeth. Harry wondered whether he should take the bandicoot around to Joe's place. It wouldn't take that long, maybe an hour. Something moved in the grass ahead, the tail and then a face of a small dog, of a dog, a pup. It had just come right out of the bushes and sniffed over the dead bandicoot, looked up at Harry. Harry checked to see if anyone was with the dog. Then he knelt down, let the dog lick his face and he cuddled the dog. It was a kelpie, he could tell because of its smile. The red brown mouth rimmed by tan, unable to hide its joy. Harry was glad too. The pup wagged its tail and started walking away from the road and it looked back to see if Harry was going to follow. He did. The dog led him into a thick pocket of trees. Harry picked up a stick, whistled and threw it, and the pup grabbed the stick in its mouth and ran ahead. Harry ran too. He chased the dog through the scrub and chased it all the way in, out into a clearing, and there was a long, bogged up paddock. There was an old wooden shack. Suddenly Harry knew where he was. He was at George Fuller's place. Kids at school were scared of George Fuller. Harry had only ever seen him once standing on the side of the road, but he didn't ever want to see him again. His face was all squashed in and he looked like a monster. Harry said that he lured people to his shack and ate them. Other kids said worse things. They said that George had killed his parents, burnt them alive while they were sleeping in their beds, and that he was crazy. Harry never came this way, and if he had to, he was always careful to stick close to the road instead of taking the shortcut. The dog dropped the stick and trotted closer to the shack. It took a few gulps of water from a yellow bucket that ran straight back, then ran straight back to Harry with an old bit of rope in its mouth. It dumped the rope at Harry's feet. Harry looked at the shack. He couldn't see any signs of George. With one eye on the house, he picked up the fat knotted rope and chucked it as far as he could. The dog was fast. It took an aerial leap had the rope in its mouth before it had time to reach the ground. Good boy, Harry said quietly. Drop it. Drop the rope. He grabbed one side of the rope and tugged. He pulled as hard as he could. It almost lifted the pup off the ground, but the dog held on and growled and pulled back. There was a creak and a door opening and Harry bolted. He ran as fast as he could, could only looking back when he had nearly reached the safety of the trees. George Fuller was standing there by his shack and he was waving. Harry's leg hit something, something sharp, and he fell hard and smacked the ground. Hop pain shot up his shin and he grabbed at his leg. Someone called out his name. He jumped up and kept running, and he didn't look back or stop until he made it to the bridge. There he hung onto the rail, caught his breath. He checked his shin. The skin was grazed, but it wasn't bleeding much. There had been no one else around. How could that man know his name? And that's where we'll stop today. On to page 43 tomorrow. Bye.